What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of a Thinking Man's Podcast. I'm your host. My name is Joseph Percher, and with me, as always, Tommy Styles. Tommy, how you doing, my friend? Good. We just recorded a whole podcast before the real podcast, so let's do this. We did. Yeah, it's a shame that we didn't record the whole thing because we probably could have just put that up and moved on with our day. But uh, Q&A episode, bringing, bringing a Q&A episode to you guys. It's been a bit since we did one. Um, so we're just going to dive right into it. Um, do you want me to start? You have one that you want to start with? Oh, I got one. We can start All it right. off with. All right. Name a time in your bodybuilding career where you had the best energy in the gym, best vibes. Hmm. I took that as like, it could have been any point of your Interesting. Uh, career. Um, right now they're good, but I would say if I had to get nostalgic about a particular time period, I would say... When I was in college, I lived in a house with me and it was eight other guys and everybody, with the exception, I think of one guy in the house, everybody trained and like was on top of their shit, like, you know, not on top of their shit in terms of bodybuilding, but everybody trained and and took it seriously. And we would all go like lift in packs, like we like Monday for legs, like we'd go lift three or four of us deep. And this was when I was first getting pretty strong. I would like was just on gear for the first time. So I was creeping up towards squatting 500 for the first time. And when you go and you have a group of friends that are there, like spotting you and fucking hyping you up to put 500 across your back for the first time, it's pretty sick. It's a, it's a pretty cool experience. So especially cause we were in college. So it was, we we're in a in our college gym, so it was all like confined to just people that were our age and and around our age group. So like you know, five hundred in a regular, even in a commercial gym that everybody's in, maybe not that big of a deal, right? I see people that squat five hundred, but in a college college gym, it's just a bunch of fucking eighteen and nineteen year old dorks. That was a big deal, like in the gym, it seemed like to me and my friends. So that was a good time. And then I would say. I had a really crazy stretch of training while I was out in Texas in the muscle factory um, where everything just seemed to click. And it was like, um, I, I felt like I could just do no wrong. Like everything that I did in the gym works. So a couple, a couple good stretches. I tell my clients this all the time, like when they're within one of these stretches where you only come across waves of progress in bodybuilding. So often I've gone months without one of these waves of progress um so when you're in one you just have to do everything possible not to fuck it up you gotta stay up on top of your sleep don't miss your shots don't miss meals if you can avoid it don't travel and go get yourself out of your routine while you're in one of these awesome waves of progress lean into that and squeeze as much out of it as you can because one of those stretches and i have to give credit to matt jansen for this because this quote or or little thing that he posted has stuck with me for years and years ago he put something up and it was like you are one off season away from making a name for yourself and though if you can have an off season that happens to coincide with one of these just crazy stretches of progress in the gym and with your physique you can make a name for yourself and so that's when you're in a groove like that that's my message for people is to try to just cultivate it and save it as long as you can because that could be the stretch that you look back on and you say, wow, that's, you know, looking back, that's a stretch that really made me who I am or made a name for myself. Yeah, no, those waves are, you almost, you only get so many in your entire career as a whole and you don't even realize it until, yeah, you know, yeah. You know, both of us 10 years plus are talking about it now, but as they were yeah. happening, I didn't realize it was a wave. No was idea. Like, yeah. Oh, this is going to go on forever. I'm going to be 500 pounds of muscle. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So mine was uh, one that jumps out as my part of my first first cycle going on testosterone. I've talked about it, 350 megs. And I was nailing my meals other than my firefighting shift, which was 10 days a month. I didn't I did nothing. I sat at home and only went to the gym 
and the gym was only a mile away. And I lived yeah, alone in awesome. the city, no family around me, no friends because it was a new city. I wasn't friends with any of the guys at the fire department. I was literally by myself. I think I might have had a girlfriend who lived far away, so she wasn't around. Um, but, and at that time, I was like, I was had a little bit more freedom with my meal plan from the coach I was working with. Mm. Um, and I remember Dante had talked about putting olive oil in shakes to gain extra mass. So I, I was drinking that. three shakes a day with olive oil thrown in, <laughs> probably just wrecking my guts, but I was gaining oh, man. Yeah. 22 pounds in 10 weeks. Nice. And all I did was sit at home other than go to the gym. I would watch Netflix because this, I mean, social media was nowhere near what it is now. This is 2015, yeah. 16. So there was nothing to do. You just, you had, yeah. you just sat around. It was awesome. Yeah. And looking back, like everything about life is so much simpler than For sure. I wasn't yeah. trying to coach or make extra money. I only worked mm -hmm. my job. Um, now don't get me wrong. I wouldn't want to live like that my whole life, but I look back on that time in bodybuilding and it was just like, man, that was really simple. Served its purpose. Um, yeah. 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 So that was fun. And then another time is uh, in 2017, I started driving 45 minutes to go to one of the most hardcore gyms in the mm. Southeast part of Michigan. And like, this place was like power lifters, strong men. Shelby Starnes was training there. A couple other pros were there. Um, and at this time I'm only like, you know, maybe 205, 210. Um, not a skinny. Def, definitely not fucking anything to look at. And like, I don't look like a bodybuilder yet in the gym. Yeah. And just to be in that environment, it's a dirty, grungy gym. No, no frills, no amenities, steel oh, yeah. plates, no windows. You can't see out. Oh, hell yeah. Pure sweat Dungeon. factory. They don't turn the AC on in the summer. It's hot as hell. And that, I remember for four months, I was driving 45 minutes one way in rush hour traffic sometimes just to go to this gym. And just the experience of doing that, now that I look back, like, don't do this, anyone. But I was pinning my insulin while driving down the highway, Jesus going Christ, to the gym, eating fucking rice crisps. Like, man, that's good ass times. But, um, <laughs> you know, now I'm blessed, dude. I have an awesome bodybuilding setup. I'm in yeah, you know, yeah. Arizona, the best gyms on the freaking planet all the best equipment that's talked about by everybody and it's almost like it can almost make you work less hard because you're so spoiled whereas like i drove 40 uh, 90 minutes of driving five times a week just to train at a really hardcore gym what are some of the best gyms like in, in terms of like just destinations or while you travel or anything what are some of the best gyms that you've been in that stand out to you or any or any bucket list gyms like that you hit or or haven't hit. I'd like to hit Armbrist in Colorado. I think that yeah has, has to be done. Um, yeah, I'm with you on that one. I've never been to Destination Dallas. I think you know I should probably. Man, I that. lived in Texas and I never went. Yeah, I there's probably a couple in Texas. I can't keep them all straight. Um, I'd like to hit MI40, Tampa. Ooh, good one. Yeah, me too. Um, I've have done, you been to Bev's? Have you been out east at all? No, we've touched on this. West Virginia is as far east as I've been. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Joe told me he lived in New Jersey, and I was like, okay, isn't that really close to like Pittsburgh? And it's still like a nine hour drive. And I was like, I've never been further east than West Virginia. So, right. The East Coast right. is a blur to me. Well, we got tons of awesome gyms out here, man. We're, we're the fucking hardcore scene out here, dude. Yeah, I think here. the East Coast is like still the mecca. If you factor fucking right, it, it is pound yeah. for pound. Yeah. Fucking right, We're it kinda, is. The West is weird because there's a little pocket up in the the Northwest that's like yep. got some hardcore, but yes. they get weak outside of that. And then, as far as I'm concerned, California's fallen way off. And yeah. Vegas is okay. Like I've been there. I, I've been to the Dragon's Lair. Um, Great gym, great atmosphere. I'm just not a fan of gyms that only have one brand of equipment as their. Me too, man. Um, I just, I there's no one brand that that hits that a home run every piece. Right, right. So, um, yeah, I've been, I'm with you about that, and and I'm with you on Vegas. Like Vegas is cool. I I would think that Vegas would be an awesome spot to live because that you have a whole arsenal of gyms that you could hit. 
And like, I know no one really even talks about it anymore uh, because all these new fucking high tech gyms have cropped up, whatever. But man, some of the, the, the couple just LVACs that they have out there, the athletic clubs, bro, they are fucking loaded with everything that you could possibly think of. I trained at one. Yeah, they're solid. They're, yeah. You could easily like you can, run a full bodybuilding program there. A hundred percent. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think because man, there's so many good gyms on like destination gyms that you have to hit that are out here. Like the Montaneri brothers up in Connecticut are out here. Bev's is out here. Diamond Gym is out here. Uh, there's the Attilish Gym down in Egg Harbor is out here. There's man, there's a lot of good gyms out in Jersey out here. Um, what about man, what other what gyms else? are out east? Hmm. I'm sh- there's fucking 10,000. I'm strong and shapely is out here up in East Rutherford. That's a fucking awesome gym. Um, what's the signature- best destination gym you've been to? Ooh, because you have you, you've been international too, right? Yeah, um, Germany, Germany. Yeah, I've been to Germany, I've been to Ireland. FIBO's this weekend, I believe. I'm happy to see them bring it back, man. There was. The Arnold, I think, is the biggest sporting event in the in the world, like per um, attendance. Yep. Or it was, you know, at, at the height pre COVID, whatever. But man, I went to FIBO in 2019, and it was fucking insane. There was I have never experienced anything like that. So to hear that they have it back now, I hope that the same amount of people are excited to come out and see bodybuilding because there was not many things that I've experienced that were like that before. I think it's the biggest expo in the world. Oh, that would make sense. That would make it's total like sense. Not, it's like a there's like equipment and they do trade expo and oh yeah, dude. It's multi there's several up like think about how big the Arnold is. You've been to the Arnold. And then think about if there was that same setup on two or three different floors. Yeah. That's what uh Dusty said. There's an like the Arnold is basically just the showroom for equipment. Yes. Yeah. You, and then there's like the whole expo. The, the whole expo. Yeah. It's wild, man. And there's so much other stuff. There's a bunch of, dude, there was bodybuilding shows taking place within the expo. Like one of this, you know, how like you have a boot, like, you know, I was there for, with Animal. We had a boot set up, whatever. And then you'd go, you know, you'd walk around a corner and then it's like ESN, other companies. And then one of the boots was just a designated stage for a bodybuilding contest. Like not the FIBO show, like a like it was as if there would be an NPC show on the floor of the Arnold. So pretty wild stuff. Destination gyms, I'm kind of stuck because I feel like a lot of the names are just places in that I've been in the area of. Um, destination gyms, man, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't. I don't really have one. Like, I haven't been to Venice. I went to California, and I was like, I went to L.A., and I was like, fuck this. There's no way that it could possibly be worth 90-minute drive in each direction. I'm not doing it. Um, you have a gym. I would love to go to MI4. I, I have said to myself that at some point I'm going to go live in around where the gym is in Tampa for MI40 for a month and then do the same thing up in Colorado for Ambrose. Just before I die and before I'm done bodybuilding, I go live there for a month and train in that gym. I think there's a decent it was, I was sitting um, there, like, gym down in um, Miami, too, that I can't think of the name. Hmm. Iron oh, Religion, yeah. maybe, is down there. Um, That's in Orlando. Oh, that might be Orlando. Yeah, you're right. Fuck. I train at Iron Religion anytime I go to Orlando. Oh, okay, right on. Okay. Yeah, he's got the uh, he's got oh, like the biohazard. Kissing me, kissing me in Orlando is hmm. very good, very good gym. Hmm. Yeah, man, I'm kind of stumped now thinking about gyms. I don't know. All the all the good ones are out are out here by me. So I've just been to all all the ones out here by me. I mean, best gym that I've ever been to, best equipped gym that I've ever been to. Probably Bev's just because of the volume of it. I mean, it's just fucking huge. Um, and it's it's super historic. I mean, it's like, fuck, like this is, that's the Mecca, Bev Francis Powerhouse Gym. That's the Mecca. So, um, 
Yeah, I would say that one. That's one that you probably have to go to as a bodybuilding fan. As a Dorian fan, you probably have to come out and see it. So, um, yeah. Anyway, um, I got a couple. So what are – this? I thought this was interesting. And this is almost is like two separate questions the way I took it. But what are the common traits of great clients and bodybuilders? Which I thought was interesting because you could answer it too. There's – there can be different traits between what would make somebody a good client and then necessarily what would make them a good bodybuilder. Um, well, good client is check in on time. No excuses. Um, no traits though. Oh, traits of a good client. Like, well, like their discipline, their their work ethic, oh yeah. all these things, right? Like obvious, enough to check obvious in ones. Time. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think a big, or maybe, or maybe in reverse, like the things that great clients wouldn't do or wouldn't have. Like I don't know, great clients have, to, and this ties in with being a good bodybuilder. You have to be eager to get better. You have to be eager to be a good client and be get better as a client. And that doesn't mean relying on a coach to hold your hand. There's no hand holding. All a coach is supposed to do is give you the guidance for you to use on your journey. They are not right. walking that journey for you. And I think that's a big right. misconception in today's coaching world. And I'm guilty right. of pampering people because I thought, man, if I take a lot of the guesswork out that I had to do, they'll be better than me. But actually, that's not always the case. And I'm learning like some stuff you just kind of have to figure out. And you might, even with the coach's guidance, it doesn't mean like there's not going to be any any hiccups. Right. I I can't hold your hand through every set you ever do and, and make sure that like you don't get an injury or you don't get a tweak or like, you almost need those things to then create a new portal of learning for yourself on your journey. I have all the knowledge I do and that I can bestow on Pete or clients because I've, I've gotten hurt enough times to where I can say like, okay, this is, this is the process now that you've had an injury. Now we have to go do X, Y, and Z. So I think, you know, step one, hire the coach you trust. Cool. But now you have to be eager to get better every single day and the discipline to check in on time and to, to give feedback, but don't, don't overcomplicate it. You know, it's, it's not this, this whole, the process of putting on muscle and bodybuilding isn't rocket science. Right. I think for both, I think just being a critical thinker is such an awesome trait to have because, you know, Tommy and I have talked about this, Tommy, you talked about it off, off air to me too. And we talked about this, but, um, like the level of anxiety that some clients have in terms of needing their hand held or to be spoon fed. It tells the coach that you just cannot think for yourself. Like Tommy and I often are sending out plans that every single thing that you could possibly imagine about the bodybuilding lifestyle A to Z are very clearly written out, very clearly programmed. We give you the reasoning. It's all right there. So then when we have clients that then follow up and we get this all the time, Hey, I, I know it says 20 grams of peanuts in my plan. Um, does that have to be lightly salted or no salted or low sodium or it's 20 grams of peanuts. Just eat the fucking peanuts. Um, the people that can think for themselves like that are just going to go so much further. Like I love for an example, I love seeing like when I get a check-in email from a client and for example, just something small, but it's, it goes a long way. They're like, Hey, you know, I know that I normally train after meal two. My, my meal two is usually my pre-workout meal. And that's how the diet is written. Um, you know, I had a crazy morning. I wasn't able to train until meal four. So I moved the meals around so that my pre-workout meal was consistent and post-workout meal was the same as it always was. And I moved the other meals around like, yes, thank you. Thank you for using your fucking brain. Um, the amount of times that people, you know, that clients will send us certain things like, you know, you can tell somebody, Hey, I want you to do 20 minutes 
on the treadmill three times a week. Hey, I just wanted to confirm, is that, is that three times a week fasted? Is that three times a week? Um, does it have to be every other day? Should it be post-work? Just read the plan and follow as it says. These people that are so super anxious and need their handheld, you know they are just not, they are either not going to last because the anxiety is just going to eat them up, eat them up, um, or they're just never going to make progress because they're just frozen by the thought of making decisions for themselves. Um, now, coaching, there should be, of course, like plenty of communication, plenty of um, clear guidance from a coach. That's not what we're getting at. There's plenty of that from a good coach. What Tommy and I, or what I'm trying to point out here is when you have that level of support from a coach and then you are still are so anxious needing to follow up and needing to question and double check and triple check, for those people, I almost want to say that maybe bodybuilding is not the right thing for that particular mindset. That doesn't mean that your mindset can't change. Um, but with where you're at mentally, bodybuilding is probably going to eat you alive if you're one of those people. So as just one trait, if I could give one trait to every client of mine, it would just be the ability to critically think for yourself. Yeah, now that critical thinking is a life skill, let alone a bodybuilding skill. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I think another one that you don't know you're developing right away, but it, you'll just, as you continue to want to be a bodybuilder every month of every year, <clears throat> you have to be willing to, and it sounds easy, but the, you have to make sacrifices um, to be a better bodybuilder. There's going to come times where you're going to have to upset some people, family, um, spouses, friends. They may not be your friends or your spouses or your family anymore it, in certain cases. Um, they're never going to understand it the way you do if it really means a lot to you. Um, and if you're trying to ride the midline or like not be on one side of the fence vehemently, like you will, you will sacrifice being to, or getting to your potential. Yes. Um, Good message. You know, I, I have had numerous things come up for me over the years and I don't even need to list them all, but it's, there are people that are no longer in my life because they didn't really like who Tommy, the bodybuilder was becoming or is. And that's cool. I, I probably don't like who they are and that's, that's perfectly fine. Yeah. Um, but you're going to have to be willing to make that decision in the moment or over time and just realize that you have to be able to cut dead weight out because Bodybuilding is selfish. Um, it is a very selfish endeavor. You're choosing yourself every single day, 365 days a year. Um, the ability to touching on the critical think, like, you know, every time you take a trip or you're away from your home turf, your coach doesn't need to like completely revamp the plan. Like I went to Michigan in February. All I did was let Dom know the days I was flying the day, I'd, the day I was flying there and the day I'd be back and I let him know I didn't have access to a stair mill and I would be using a treadmill. He said, cool. I didn't ask for a special diet. They have stores in Michigan. I can go buy all the food that I buy in Arizona there. You, you guys need to figure this out. You don't get to take, you know, it doesn't mean like, okay, I'm traveling. So that means five days, just do whatever. And then I'll get like, that's five days of the year that you just yeah. completely disregarded any sort of adherence. And this okay. isn't going to be the only time that person no, tries. No, and if that's your motive that every person, single time, yeah. that will add up over the years, over the month. And it's like, now there are certain things, like a, a huge international trip in an off season. Yeah, do your thing. But, you know, every time you're like out of town for an extended period of month, like you don't get a new diet. Take 10 yeah. meals with you, man. I've flown with like pounds of food just to go to Florida before. Like, oh yeah. Make it work. Dude, I just went to Chicago for two days and- the amount of frozen meat that I packed was obscene or just my meals. I just portion out my meals and freeze each of them in their own individual bag. This is Wednesday's meal one. This is Wednesday's meal two, so on and so forth. That way there is no, um, I'm not compromising on it. Okay. Yes. I, I made this choice to travel. Um, I'm doing this and I'm not going to allow this to affect my bodybuilding in a negative way. 
Um, and if that sounds too extreme to anyone listening, then you've identified that this, that this level of bodybuilding isn't for you and you'll get as much as you can out of the level you're willing to give. But yeah, I work with bodybuilders. Like I, I just expect it. You know, if you have questions about how to travel for sure, I'll, I'll give you some guidance, but oh, also yeah. again, that's where critical thinking comes in. Like, right. There is, there are ways to do things in life without having someone tell you what to do. Yeah. Um, and it's, being it's, it's being resourceful is a, a good trait. Oh, that's a good one. Data and a, that is a good one. And that's another thing too. Like, even if you can't, for whatever reason, if you can't be the person that individually packs the same food per meal, um, you know, and travel with exactly your diet, be resourceful and be a critical thinker on the road. Like you said, there's stores in Michigan. Guess what, guys? There's fucking stores everywhere. You can get everything that you need. There's really no reason. Like you said, if you're wanting to bodybuild at a high level, there's no reason you shouldn't be doing these things. Because guess what? I work with a handful of lifestyle guys that never want to get on a bodybuilding stage. And they are 10 times more fucking hardcore than half of the guys that I have that say that they want to compete. So you know, and these are guys that have a family at home, they work a full-time job and this is just truly a hobby and they're still all in to the nth degree. So, um, yeah, I think all of that stuff, being resourceful, being a critical thinker, all of those things, like you said, are their life skills, but they will make you a better bodybuilder and then it'll make the relationship with the coach that much better too. Um, I got one or do you, do you have one? Go ahead. I'll go next. Um, this could be just a quick one. I don't know. I man, I saw this and I wasn't even sure who to think of. But um, who are the most underrated bodybuilders that come to mind? So we could do this. I, I don't know. I thought about it like in this generation, who's been underrated or who's coming up? Yeah, we'll talk current. Um, I wouldn't say he's underrated, but I think he's one big season away from really mixing it up and this is a big if but it's uh it's regan grimes mm. if regan fills that frame and then starts to bring it conditioning wise that structure in the open class with the way they look like they're shifting some of the judging oh yeah watch out yeah i think it may that's a that's a great point just about the way that the industry is shifting towards the the industry standards are shifting back towards him as he's growing towards it. So at some point it's going to collide. And uh, anyone that's followed me for a while knows I'm a big fan of Reagan's. Um, yeah, I, I, man, that's a, that's an awesome pick. And that's somebody because he's taken an off season, a long off season, he's kind of out of the public eye right now. No one's really necessarily talking about him. Man, if if you could buy stock in somebody as in bodybuilding, he would be somebody to to get in on. Um, yeah, if we play it like we're playing racehorses, like that's probably one that has super high odds, and you like, yeah. Throw a oh, he's plus ten thousand. Yeah, you put yeah, four you bucks cash, on it. You cash in. Oh yeah. Um, underrated bodybuilders right now. Um. Hmm. I don't, I don't necessarily, maybe this isn't underrated, but I think that Quentin is eventually going to be another one of those guys that just smashes everything in front of him. And I don't know that a lot of people understand that. I think more people understand it now. A lot of the guys on the, on like Fuad's podcast talk about him and kind of, kind of let the cat out of the bag. So I don't know if we could say he's underrated. He might be properly rated at this point, but he's somebody to keep an eye on. Um, Man, is it is it possible to say that Samson is still underrated? I feel like he should be looked at as a favorite to win the Olympia this coming year. And if he's not, then I don't know. Like, and I don't hear that many people talking about it. Like, if he brought that same that Arnold look that just won the Arnold against all these other guys that are Olympia contenders, if you just drop that into the Olympia last year, I think he's he might be the last man standing. 
So if he brings an improved look on that and it's, you know, a pretty similar lineup to this lineup that we saw last year was fucking insane at the Olympia. And I still think if he's even about the same or slightly improved on the Arnold look, I expect, I fully expect him to go into the Olympia this year and win. I, that's just how I'm looking at it. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm off and I'm overrating him, but I just think that to see the tr- like the way that his look has continued to trend and the way that it gets rewarded each time, each time he makes a leap, it's rewarded within the judging. So at this point, how could you not expect him to make another leap that then gets rewarded by the judging? I don't know. Um, I mean, like we're talking about every year for the past couple of years, we've all eaten it up when Nick Walker was like, I'm going to win the Olympia. We've all been behind that and seen that he has the right to say that. Um, And then Samson just came into the Arnold and won with straight ones across the board against Nick. So what does that say for where Samson is? I don't know, but I guess we'll see. He's like maybe the hottest name in the industry right now. So maybe not underrated again, but I just, I think that for all the excitement, I almost think that people don't understand what this, what that win really signified for him. Like he's the, like, I think he's the guy moving forward. When you win an Arnold, regardless of what your Olympia results are, your name is in the history books yes. for, forever. Forever. You've won an Arnold. It's yep. the second biggest title there is. And in yep. some regards, a guy who wins three Arnolds probably is more known than a guy who maybe got one Olympia. Like right. Chris Dickerson won an Olympia. And right. 99% of the people who just heard that name on this podcast might not know who that is. All right. Flex Wheeler, though, had what, five or something? Dexter yeah. won like a handful of them. Like Dexter won, yeah, like five. Um, yeah. No, but it, it is a great title. You're right. So. I think uh, when I think of like up and comers who are like in that upper mid tier. I think of like a Nathan Epler who's moving from 212 to open. Okay. Yeah. I think that's a guy who could make some noise in a tier two show and then potentially yeah. win an open show. Yeah, absolutely. Like a guy like Ross Flanagan is big round doing Toronto pro might make some noise up there. There's a lot of guys who are like, we talked about that, you know, one good off season away from making your name. Yes. Like a lot yeah. of these guys are one good showing or one good placing away from, Levitating. Changing your like, look at Samson. Samson yeah. is no like this was like two years ago. This guy was not winning shows. Kind of a nobody, to be honest. Yeah. Like I have to give it to Fuad because he signed Samson and was pumping Samson up way before anybody else saw it in terms of what his high end potential could be. And I think if you asked him in an honest moment, he probably would have never said that he expected this from Samson. I, I mean, within 18 wait. months or two years, like you said, he goes from someone that can't win the big man in Spain to winning the fucking Arnold. And this is not someone, this is not even, like, this is not also, let's not forget, like, this is not Nick Walker or Derek Lunsford fucking rising prodigy right from the jump. This is someone, I think Samson's in his late 30s. Like, this is someone that has had a major resurgence like near the end of his career and now and i just say that because of his age but now knowing how fresh he is and seeing the way that he's continued to improve like there's no reason to believe even if he is 37 or 38 that he doesn't have another five spectacular years in front of him yeah if the joints are good and and he's smart with you know doesn't get they talk about it like he's on baby shit well, I figured that anyway, but I just mean like I know. if your I know. body is okay, joint yeah. line. I think I think the joints play just a bigger role as far as the internal health. I think a lot Maybe of guys more. Maybe yeah, more. I think a lot of guys get to that upper 30s and they're just mad. Like everything they're yeah. hanging on by threads with some I, of the ligaments. I feel like the man, you get me deep into a training block at 30, like I am, like yeah. week five or week six of a training block, and I'm like Man, I'm taping myself together on the way out to the gym, dude. So I hear you. I hear you. But that's another one of those things, dude. Him, like Dexter, I think they knew that and have been training to not deteriorate themselves 
in the long term. Like they play, they truly play the long game in terms of how their joint health was going to be too. And it's, it's paying off, man. I think Samson, honestly, if he brings the physique that deserves it, I think they would love to crown him and try to build him up as the next like legacy, Mr. Olympia. See, I think we're in a time where like, I don't, you know, there's no, nobody's set to take a reign like a, seven years in a row yeah like i know like, no, i could see him doing it i could see no heir apparent man i could see if would anyone be surprised if the story at the end of this season was that andrew jack showed up healed out of his mind at the olympia and won would anyone be surprised i don't think so i, I mean not think, shocked not crazy shocked and i'm a guy who's i, I mean you, i was blown away by him at the arnold's no, yeah, Andrew Jack, he's upside to a trillion, but I'm yeah. talking like I'm a guy who Hunter Le, if Hunter Labrada could easily go from seventh to third, or second. Oh, easily, easily. So it was more, it was more like, of a, yeah. Oh, yeah. You see, that is a good point because now get knocked off the throne, then it's like, yeah. okay, no one expects anything. Yeah, you, you, you have like freedom to yeah. like, yeah, maybe kind of work in the shadows and shock Very everybody. True. That's a great point because this is still the same guy that everyone was talking about possibly being in the mix to win the Olympia this past year. And he's then, never lost a show other than the Olympia still. To right. this day. He's never lost a show. Right. right. I believe he's doing Tampa and Texas, I heard. so. I thought he said Chicago, but I could be wrong. He, it would be silly that he wouldn't do Texas, I think. I can't keep up. I, there's too much no, who knows? I don't know. I don't know. I could be totally wrong. Um, it would make sense for him to do Texas, though. You'd think that he would have a fucking... That would be like when Kukla would do the Texas all those years, where everyone in fucking Texas seemingly is there for him. Um, but yeah, man, just a lot of... There's a lot of people... That was what was so exciting about this Olympia. And then even the Arnold, too, was that there was a handful of guys that you could legitimately see winning the show. Um, but man, like you said, in terms of how the industry seemingly is being shaped with the judging i could see samson collecting a couple of them man because he just has it he just has that silhouette i think he just needs to fill that back in a little bit more and i think with the win at the arnold i think he's i think they've shown him that that condition is all he needs to do to win he doesn't need to be crazy peeled i think it's it's hard it's it's tough because usually, in my opinion, the Arnold judging and the Olympia judging are different. It's different. Bit. You're right. No, you made that point to us. We talked about it privately. I made a point about, yeah. you know, to you what that win for Samson might mean. But they had him Nick's. in straight one. So, well, but but I was saying because, you know, I tried to make a point to you after the Arnold. I was like, wow, I wonder what this says for Nick's future if they're showing that this physique is better than his, like where does he go from here? How could he expect to bypass Samson at any point? But you made the point in that moment. You're like, well, the Olympia is always judged a little bit differently in terms of, and I think the point you're trying to make is that they favored kind of the brutal mass a little bit more. It's um, a big man show. It is a big man show, but Samson's a fucking big man. That's what I think the message. He's kind of got it all. He's kind of got it like, all you have to be a freak and that's your strong card to play. Samson's kind of a freak with structure. So yeah. Yeah. With structure. And then the only thing you know, he kind of lacks in, and maybe he doesn't even lack depending on perspective is condition, but right. Right. From, staying, from what perspective from every body part other than his glutes, I think he's fucking diced or his glutes, yeah. you know, genetically meant to look like Brian Balzano's obviously not. Um, you know, not everybody has those. So it's not necessarily, I like, I like that the Olympia judging, it feels like they have gone away from making it a glute and ham contest. I like that. I like getting to see the pinnacle of our sport at their best in terms of muscularity and fullness. Like, of course there needs to be a standard for conditioning, but I don't want to see 
six foot tall James withered away on stage. I want to see him blasting full and I want to see a fucking freak show. So Mm -hmm. to, for them to kind of allow that a little bit more at the Olympia, I definitely like, and I think that Nick needs to like talking about him. I think he needs to lean back into that going into this season. Um, He's done an awesome job. He's done an awesome job with the waist. He's done an awesome job trying to streamline it as much as he can. Um, But at the end of the day, he's one of the freakiest human beings on planet earth. And he needs to lean into that and like blow people away with that because his shape is going to be what it is. And he's done a good job improving it, but his game is muscularity and crazy conditioning too. So, um, he's shown that he can be full and crazy big with the dugout hamstrings and glutes. Um, Like they obviously tried to play the conditioning game at the Arnold. And I don't know that it improved him that like, I don't know that the harder lighter look was better for his physique. If that makes sense. It's how it's apples and oranges. Cause I mean, yeah, I, I, you'd liked it. I covered that show with you as yeah. I had Nick winning. So I thought so. T- I thought yeah. that Nick was going to get the call. I did. We said that after prejudging. And then if you, the scorecards came out, it was like Sam straight was ones. Never, yeah. Never, never a doubt. Numbers. Yeah. So that to me is like, damn, maybe I was using a little bit of my bias of what I like in my yeah. judging. So but also had we gone into it, you know, with the awareness of thinking like, Hey, remember they've judged this show a little bit differently. We might've been looking at it from a different lens, you know, Um, because that is a great point. And that's one that I didn't consider, but that's always been the case. Cedric McMillan was never going to win an an Olympia with that physique, but he got to the Arnold and he was always a contender and even won it. So, you know, and that's a, that show precisely is another good example of that where, he beat Dallas. Dallas was blown out full 320 pounds. Um, but Cedric with that shape, the the beautiful posing, all of it, it was, it was judged a little bit differently. I think if you drop the same two physiques on an Olympia stage, I think Dallas probably gets the call. Agreed. Yeah. He's just brute mass. Yeah, man. That's just, uh, I saw a post about him recently that it was recently, I guess his birthday or something just crazy to think that it's been i guess six years now since he's passed and that he would only be 32 or 31 i think i saw this year he's only um man older than me man that is that is makes it like at the time i was devastated i was a huge fan of his man i was convinced he was the guy i was like he's next he's next up um and then the same year uh also, Rich Piana died. Rich Piana, yeah, crazy man. I remember it was man. That was such a weird thing because I just remember feeling like, in both instances, that I'd like lost somebody that I knew, even though I didn't know them. Yeah, Rich's legacy still like he's still on every meme and and clip and it's yeah he'll really, live on forever, dude. He will live on as long as yeah, bodybuilding that is continues to be a thing. And like, I, I tip my hat like that was his. You know, Rich, that was his purpose was to leave a legacy like sure. that. He wanted yeah. people to be talking about him six years. And like, I, I respect that. You know, maybe you don't like the decisions people make, but that guy was living the life he wanted to be living. Oh, and he looked how he wanted to look. He lived how he Talked wanted how to he live. Wanted. Every, every single 100%. decision he made was what he wanted to do. And, and we were talking about earlier, like people that ride the midline or whatever, that was never rich. And so at, at the bare minimum, I respect the hell out of that. No, yeah, I just I sent uh I think I sent Dusty a, a meme about like Rich talking and he was just like, Oh my it was between my girlfriend or getting this meal in, like fuck her, she's gone, I gotta get this food in. I just <laughs> like it was with this rich delivery and it's just so yeah. like yeah. man, that's that's awesome. Yeah. Um I got one. It's it's like it, I saw I remember something with Rich too. It was like you know, my girl just told me like it was either her or the gym. So which flavor pre-workout do you think I should take? <laughs> yeah, that stuff is still so funny to me because Rich, uh, he kept it real, man. Some I still go back to his YouTube every now and then, like 
and it was it's gold. It's like almost eight years old. And so I'll gold. tell you this. I got something from Rich Piana probably 11 years ago. And for whatever, for whatever reason, I, as soon as he said it, I just, as soon as I heard it, I just took it as gospel and applied it for probably seven or eight years. And then now we see, hear all this research where it's like, Oh, the length end, you could do partials, you could do stretch partials and all this stuff. He put out a squat video where all he did was barbell squats. He did like 25 sets of barbell squats or something. And he was adamant about the fact that you do not come up and lock your knees back out like mm -hmm. that. You keep the constant tension. You keep a, a good groove. You keep the tension on the quads, whatever. And from that moment, that was how I did all of my quad movements. And now of course, genetics and how hard you train, all that stuff plays a role, but my legs are my best body part. And I've gone, I've recently have gone back to my rep cadence being that way. And my legs are blown out, painfully pumped. For a while, I was doing like the super full range of motion in both directions, like super deep, and then lock it out at the top, reset every rep. And I just didn't get, subjectively, I just didn't get the same pumps as keeping it tense. Um, so I got to give, I got to give Rich credit for that. That was something even today or back then, that was probably something that people would have been like, oh, that's fucking bro science, whatever. And then now fast forward 12 years. And that's something that the science dorks would be like, he's right. He was right all along. Do you think I actually to couple with this? Cause I just saw, we must be seeing the same clips. Cause I just saw like a Machiavelli motivation um, clip on Instagram of, I believe branch Warren. And I thought to myself, like so many people, talk shit about how this dude trains and i'm like this guy had won an arnold he was second, second in the olympia to jay cutler he won two no he, he was second at the olympia yeah yeah, yeah. second and like yeah. and he's got 180 pound nerds talking about right. how he trains like an idiot yeah now obviously you know don't go mimic every single thing he right. does but at the same time like show some respect dude that dude is a brute barrel of mass Oh, hundred like, percent, and it works. I like, a kick the other day of like a front double of like him six months out from the year he won the Arnold. Like he looked, he had good, not great structure, but it wasn't like abysmal. No, his injuries really did him. It, like you look at a young Branch Warren. There's a picture of him at like 22, front double bicep. He's wearing Nash, some like yeah, yeah, I know some, the one you're talking about. Some fucking he's wearing like a beanie, and I think he's wearing like boots, <laughs> awesome. but. Fucking incredible, dude. Almost like Lee Priest. Like yeah. just crazy shape, tiny little little waist, fucking quads to the moon. Like, um, but that was that is one of the messages that what you're talking about with branch is one of the messages I've tried to get back to conveying like online and just to my clients and stuff. Cause we I think we were, or me personally, I was too focused on like the precise execution of these little movements and they help they will help you develop connections and they will help you develop a physique or a low a weak body part but man i've started to say this to people like certain movements like you know any like chest supported row or upper back row um you know kind of for for quads you kind of have to think this way i'm starting to tell people like just train like branch warren or think like you're johnny jackson like you have to move some big fucking slug weight sometimes, especially her, the body part. Like, does it make sense to get fucking sloppy and try to cur or curl 80 pounds with your biceps? No, it doesn't. But is the rubber going to meet the road on a fucking big upper back row with four plates where you're going to have to sling it a little bit? Yeah, that's going to have to happen at some point. And guess what? It's built some fucking incredible physiques. Some of the most incredible physiques that have ever walked planet Earth were built by just sheer hard work. So the colorful spreadsheets, the beautiful programming, the thoughtful execution cues, all this stuff is great. But success has left us clues from the beginning of time. And time and time again, the most rugged muscular physiques that we see on a bodybuilding stage were built by guys that were just fucking training their ass off and not listening to the rules, not worrying about 
overtraining or does my elbow line up with this? No, they're going to fucking train until it doesn't move anymore. They're going to move it until it doesn't move anymore. And that's when their set is done. And you do that for 10 years and it might grow something worth mentioning. I think there's something to be said about having the ability to simply go into the gym and pummel yourself. Just bring it. Yeah. There should be 100%. almost like a full body, just like pressure when you leave the gym after a hard leg day, like, man, I am, I can't do anything today. There's like nothing. That, I have nothing left. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like even some of your warmups should be so like brutally taxing that you're like, I don't know how I'm going to do this work set. That, that was a hard warm up set. Yeah. I just don't see anybody building the density and the mass required to be competitive without that type of style yeah. or without that mentality. Yeah. Like style is a good word for it. Like it, it should be an overarching theme to your training. Like when, you know, when certain things call for it, you need to just fucking unleash it. And like the people that love training like that, like the, like that's where it all has to start. The bodybuilders that last in this game and the bodybuilders that make something of themselves, they have a passion for training and what that is, if I really had to break it down, is a combination of a very high pain tolerance bordering on the enjoyment of pain. Yeah. Like when someone tells me they enjoy training, that's where my brain goes. Like, oh, okay, I understand you're also one of these sick people that likes to torture themselves with weights. And so those are the people then that like when the rubber meets the road, like they are going to do the, the training is everything. The training is everything. It starts everything. So those people that love to train, those are going to be the people that no matter what, they're going to get results. Yeah. I mean, I'm grateful that I had the, you know, Dusty to, to show me what training was. And then Dante, yeah. Yeah, obviously God, with DC yeah. and he showed Dusty. And it's just like, you have to, you know, we, the Branch Warren is such an extreme example, but when I look at guys who train just brutally hard, I think of John Meadows. I think of Sean oh, Corita. Yeah. Yeah, I think Sean, of Evan yeah. Santapani. Yeah. You got to think some of these guys don't post a lot of their training over the years, but you probably right. know better than anybody. Like Evan trains his ass off. Yeah. Um, A lot of different guys, like they might've had a different style about them and maybe some were loud, some weren't, some used ballistic training somewhere more calculated, but all of them at the end of the day found a way to brutally fatigue the muscle over and yes. over and over and over again yes. and over and over and over again. And that's what, and that's and a that's, shout out to Marshawn Lynch. Yeah. That's what it comes down to is just adding up those years and, or those yes. months and years in the gym. Yeah. And it's just time under the bar. Like it's just you Reps. forcing, Reps. forcing the issue. Like, Man, think about the fact like, and and we could all be more intentional. I could be more intentional with this as I'm saying this, thinking about like every gym, every time you're going into the gym, it's like, man, I'm trying to create something here. Like I'm, I'm literally build, you can build your physique to whatever degree you want. Or if you want big calves, guess what? T starting tomorrow, you could do 45 sets of calves a week. And within three months, you're going to have bigger calves than most people, I would say, if you did something ridiculous like that. So I almost like I, I'm when I'm really mindful and intent, like uh, intentional, I go into the gym almost thinking like, man, this is my chance to fucking create something. Like, I'm just going to go in here and spend everything that I have on it. And it might be fucking eventually it might be something awesome. Yeah, you should learn how to train as hard as you possibly can. And then along the way, you might realize like, all right, that way is working for this body part, but yeah. this body part is not growing at all. So then okay, right. now at right. that time, it's time to change it up. Right. But I, that was my, that was my journey. Exactly. I could smash my legs, just brute force. They grow, do that to everything up top. Nothing grows. Everything's, yeah. everything's injured. No, no, none of the muscles grow. So you have to learn to adapt. And like you said, there's. I had to learn what what the bicep equivalent of a fucking shaky, brutal final rep on a hack swap looked like. It doesn't look the same, but 
I don't know, man, you can just go in and, and you can go through the motions and you can do the plan that's written down. But I, and like, I just think a lot of times if you ask people, they're going to the gym just because they're going to the gym. Like I saw this, this thing the other day and it was like, nobody trains to be great anymore. Nobody practices to be great anymore. Like if you stop somebody on their way into the gym and you were like, Hey man, before you go in there, like, what are you about to do? What are you going in here for? Do you think how many people would be like, I'm going in here because I'm on a fucking mission to be great. Do you think anybody would say that to you? I, I would be very surprised. No. And I probably wouldn't. I probably am not that intentional when I go into the gym, but talking through this, like this is one of these things that I can take from the show. Absolutely. There's times I take my work into the gym and I'm thinking about too, things I might yeah. still have to do, or I screwed myself with my time of going to the gym and I yeah. worked so much that now my I'm almost fried mentally. Yeah. And uh, it's so, yeah, one or the other. We were talking about it earlier. Like you can either get all your shit done as a coach or, you know, whatever, any job, but you can get all your shit done first and then go train with a clear mind. But then your reserve, like your energy reserves are probably not there. If you're a good coach and you're really putting a lot of effort into what you're giving back to people, you're going to be exhausted. But then on the flip side of it, so I try to go train in the morning before, but then all the emails and all the WhatsApp start rolling in while you're training. And it's like, fuck, I'm way behind. Like you're not, but you were like, man, I'm so behind. I haven't gotten to any of this yet. So it's easy, you know, in a mo in this modern world, we have so many distractions but the if phones, nothing else man, from this phones. entire fucking episode, as we talk through all this, if there's nothing else that anybody takes from this that's listening, it's to just be intentional with your time. Your like not your time, but like your the time that you have in the gym. Like that's a privilege to be in there, and it's a privilege to be able to try to change how your body physically looks. Um. So yeah, I mean, I'm like, I'm, we're talking about this, and I'm like, today's not even a training day for me, and I don't feel like I want to go train. I mean, every time I've trained with Turner Riddle, it's it's that that type, this type of energy where it's like, because he trains with such a force coming off him that you have to match it. Yeah. And, and that, I often joke, like, I don't know if I could do that full time because I probably right. would burn out. Yeah. It would have to be in like spurts because there's so much, I guess you call it masculinity or just like, force around me while force I'm training. Is a good there. word. Yeah. And that's how it was with Dusty is just like we show up to the gym for legs and I know it's about to be 3 hours round trip of yes. just brutality. <laughs> yes. And <laughs> I'm going to limp to my car soaked, <laughs> completely soaked, head to toe, bite off I'm, the nausea on the way there. Yeah. I'm going to sit there when I get in and I'm just going to like yeah. look like it, look like what just happened. But also be in like this eternal state of gratitude and like bliss of like check i did what i needed to do today yeah i think you have to like like you said you have to like want that there has to be some sort of compulsion in you that like you don't feel well if you don't get that every like 30 or 48 hours yeah and there also has to be like just this willingness to keep showing up and doing that you can't do that one day and then take the next two weeks train like a pussy and then have another good day. like that has to be the standard that you are able to set for yourself time and time again and that's just you don't know any different um and that's i truthfully i use fuel of the people around me who are training kind of like half ass or like you said they're not training to be great they're just kind of there to like hey i'm at the gym bro what's up and yeah like, checking in on facebook oh man you're here and i'm here like i'm gonna yeah. show you what it's like to really train yes. yeah and i hope i'm gonna like make us like turner and i talk it's like we call it making a scene like I'm going to make a scene. I'm going to train with so much fucking aggression. There's going to be some noise, but I want everyone to like, look at how hard I'm training. Yeah. And yeah, I don't even know yeah, what the question it. was that got us here, but that that's cool. me either. Me either. No, we just talked for like 40 minutes. I don't think that there was even a, a topic or a question, but I think that's probably a good place to wrap it. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was a good one guys. So, uh, for Tommy Styles, I'm Joseph Percher. This was a Thinking Man's podcast. This was episode 51 of a Thinking Man's podcast. So next week, there's going to be a little bit of an exciting announcement about the evolution of what Tommy and I have been doing over the past year. 
Um, so stay tuned for that. As always, thanks for listening to the show. Until next time, guys, we are out.